All right. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to 60 Minutes of Unscripted .NET Entertainment. Uh, here on the On.NET Live Show, our mission is to empower the .NET community to achieve more. Something that is not our mission is to try to sell you some .NET merch, where uh, David <laughs> and I, we inadvertently coordinated. <laughs> um, but anyway, I'll be one of your hosts, uh, Luis, and with me are my co-hosts, Myra and David. Uh, if you're new to the show, uh, I'd just like to remind you that here we have hallway conversations on different topics related to community projects and things happening in the community. And with us today to talk about one of his projects is Georgie here. Georgie, welcome. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Uh, so I'm a software engineer working uh, primarily with C Sharp and .NET. And today I will be talking about uh, one of my open source projects, which is uh, uh, it would be uh, it, uh, it, it's a link uh, implementation for GraphQL. Uh, it's not the full full implementation of uh, link. Uh, it only supports uh, a little subset of all the available operators. So it's a little bit of an it's a duration to say that it's uh, linked to GraphQL library, but uh, it's a working uh, prototype. And I hope the viewers will get interested about it and enjoy the library when using uh, GraphQL from .NET. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, I'm fairly new or you know, don't have much experience with GraphQL, so I'm super excited to learn, learn more here. Um, but to get started, uh, do you want to go over to the related bits segment and talk a little bit about some tools? All right, David, so what do you have for us in the related bits here? Awesome, thank you so much. So I'm going to share my screen and this is the GitHub GraphQL Explorer. So GitHub has a GraphQL implementation and this API exposes everything you'd ever want to, you know, query against um, for uh, GitHub. So there, there's tons of things here. So in this Explorer, um, are we showing the link here in the bottom for the banner? Make sure we do that. Um, so when you first log into it, you can, uh, you know, essentially put in a query viewer login, and this will just show uh, who's currently logged in. So this is my GitHub handle, iEvangelist. And so that's pretty uh, straightforward, um, not, not super complex or anything, but they have the ability to author all sorts of things. There's an explorer here that lets you um, kind of visualize all of the available API endpoints. And one thing that's really cool about GraphQL is GraphQL is a single endpoint. So you can, you can do either queries or mutations um, with the GitHub one specifically. I think there's actually subscriptions as well uh, for other GraphQL implementations. Um, but so we can define a query and we can give it a name. 
So it's non uh, anonymous. So get .NET docs labels, for example. We can walk up to repository, give it a name and an owner. We can then evaluate whether or not it's private, um, the name with the owner. We can ask for the repository's labels. We can filter those. We can do all sorts of things. And it gets really, really um, uh, expressive. And I love that GraphQL with a single endpoint. Um, you can kind of specify what you want returned. And that's that's really the big selling point of GraphQL. So unlike REST, uh, REST APIs are, they're kind of, you know, static in that you have to kind of, you know, use the URL to build out, you know, walk up to different collections and, um, you know, that, that endpoint will define a, you know, a, a single shape. And that shape is kind of static. With GraphQL, your request, so this query right here is actually what would be the request. This defines the shape of what is returned. And that's really, really uh, powerful. Uh, so it's, it, it also supports uh, parameters, you know, variables, things of that nature. So we've got a query where we're asking for, uh, you know, we, uh, the parameter user, uh, user, and then like the number of polls. So we can walk up to users. We can say, uh, here's the login. So for this user, um, let's see how many pull requests they have. Let's get the, the last seven pull requests. And edges and nodes, these are just common aspects of graph. Um, these are like generic objects that kind of define what are available once you get into like a pull request. What does that actually look like? So one of the nodes will have a state, a uh, title created at. We just run that here in the browser and you can see the return. So you get data, the user, pull requests. Here's the edges. One of the nodes says that the state was merged. The title is update default interface methods markdown, and that was created on this date, right? So uh, with GraphQL, it's extremely powerful. And that URL that we provided is a link to the Explorer, and you can go try it today entirely free of charge. If you have a GitHub account, sign in and start exploring all of the data that's out there and uh, really start learning GraphQL. So that's that's kind of it for the related bits portion. So I'm excited now to jump over to Georgie's project in the hallway track. Awesome. So Georgie, that was the related bits section that kind of corresponds to the things that we're going to be talking about today. So I love C Sharp. I love Link, uh, especially. Um, so Link is language integrated um, query syntax, right, inside uh, of C Sharp. So with Link, uh, there's lots of already, you know, implementations out there. There's stuff for like Link to objects, Link to ADO.net, right, going to a database. So now what you've put together in your open source repository is Link to GraphQL. So I would love to see what this looks like. So can you just kind of tell us a bit, you know, high level, what what the design goals are, and then maybe we'll look at code and get some um, of our viewers asking questions. Yeah. So, so yes, as uh, as we saw in the related bits section, uh, to run the GraphQL queries, we need to put the, um, we need to send the request, which is a, uh, it looks like JSON, but it's not really JSON, uh, but it's structured according to the schema that the GraphQL server that we are querying exposes. Um, so you, you, you can't query for the fields that the object does not have, and uh, you have to match the casing, and basically you have to be very uh, attentive because if you misspell the name of the field, uh, you will get the error back that the field was not found. So it's uh, pretty much weakly mm, typed, not really checked at compile time. So if you if you want, if you need to query the GraphQL endpoints with uh, .NET, uh, you you need to write these queries as strings, just like you. We used to write SQL queries before entity framework and link with hand. So, so basically, my idea. I was just going to ask the the syntax. It was kind of what David was showing before, right? Yes, yes, it was 
just uh, example of the GitHub GraphQL endpoint, but the syntax is uh, same for every GraphQL implementation. It's just uh, the object names and the those names are different for different endpoints. Uh, so yeah, that was sorry. That was going to be my question there, which is around the you know how you define the names and and how that GraphQL syntax looks like. Um, you know, because with REST you kind of have some sort of predefined ways to call these different endpoints. With GraphQL, it seems like it's a little bit more more flexible. So you know, what's what's that process for like you know choosing these names and building out these these APIs? Yeah. So with GraphQL, unlike uh, REST APIs. Uh, you you when you build the so you can either start with schema first and have the, the implementation and the classes generated for you or you can start building uh, with some of the libraries you can just build the endpoint and it will also generate your uh, schemas at the runtime um, like similar to what the vsdl and so services had in the those days, like you could either start with contract first or with implementation first. So it's kind of similar in that uh, way. You're bringing back some old memories there. Soap. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, yeah, there are some uh, awkward similarities between <laughs> these two. It's like uh, always returning 200 even if it's error, but you have to dig in the uh, return JSON to find the exact error. So it's not really RESTful, but it works on top of HTTP. So it's kind of, mm, there is some commonality between these two. The difference is that uh, with SOAP, you had pretty strictly defined objects. And uh, if you needed only one or two fields from the data that was returned, you could not uh, omit the other fields and get only two properties if you needed only two. With GraphQL, you can just uh, list the fields explicitly that you need. Actually, you you can't uh, ask for the whole object unless you list all the properties separately. So you have to be uh, explicit and ask for every property that you need. So it kind of uh, pushes you in a way to think which properties you are going to need and request only the bits that you need. So it's kind of uh, helpful for resources and network and stuff like that. There right. is no select star. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. That's funny. Yeah, so it, it's really a way to optimize, like you said, the, the network bandwidth, right? Because you as the consumer of said API, you're specifying exactly the things that you want, right? Whereas with yeah. REST, it's like hit this endpoint and maybe you're hitting multiple endpoints and then on the client, you know, joining things together and it's, you know, or dissecting things or, you know, I only need two parts of this. So it's like, yeah, interesting. I like that. Um, so are we able to share your screen now? It looks like you're on the StreamYard image yet. Yes. Let's share. Perfect. OK. Yeah. So so with GraphQL, uh, you have a uh, defined schema, like I said. So uh, this is a uh, endpoint for SpaceX, SpaceX, uh, SpaceX rocket launches. Uh, this is uh, not. Uh, it's not, not an official SpaceX API. It's just a open source. Um, sure, sure. Can you do me a favor? So, can, can you zoom in real yeah. quick on this, Georgie? Some uh, perfect. That's much better. Thank you so much. So, uh, just like we saw with the GitHub example, this uh, this is the graph graphical is the um, another open source project. Let's that can take the endpoint address and it lets you visualize the schema. So here are the queries that this SpaceX endpoint has. And for example, one of the queries that I have here is to see the details of the company. So it's really simple, really basic. It's just listing all the uh, properties that the 
company has. So we can see these fields uh, are in the schema explorer here on the right side. And so here is this query here. And if I click this button and run this query, I will get the results uh, on the right side here. So the so response is... Uh, Real quick Jason? question, real quick yeah. question here. So for the stuff that we're seeing on the left, can you elaborate a little bit on like line two where it says result? So is that a name that we get to define as the consumer? Yes, this is, yes, this is the alias that you we will get of the resulting object. So this result here on the right is whatever we put here. So if I just uh put here result company and run this i will get the result company on the result as well so it just gives us an option to uh, name the resulting object in the json response and then the company after the semicolon that is the object type right uh company is the part of the schema yeah, it's part of the schema. So if we right. one of the fields, perhaps. Yeah. So company, if we so if we dig in this query objects, uh, we can see the uh, objects or methods that this query has. So it has this company, and info is a object just like the return type of this company query. And if we click on the info, we, we see the properties that it has and also the types of these properties. So perfect. And and just a quick question here. So I noticed the URL here is that a SpaceX land API. Uh, this explorer is this like a like a you know, sort of a general tool that you can just plug any endpoint, GraphQL endpoint to, and it will show you sort of the schema, or or does each sort of person have to kind of implement their own version of this explorer? Yeah. So in in this case, it's the it's uh, basically they are hosting their own explorer, but I think there is a public uh, explorer where you can just put the address of the endpoint, and it will pull the uh, schema and show you the uh, schema of the endpoints that you plugged in. Gotcha. Okay, so very similar to like Open API, uh, right? Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Thanks. Yeah. So, so we can see on the right side here is the uh, resulting result that we got back from the endpoint. If I remove some of the properties here, for example, if I decide that I don't need this test sites property, which I don't need, for example, for this uh, query and remove this, this as well and click this button. We, uh, we will see that the these properties have disappeared now. So the, the resulting object is always a JSON. So it can be an array or a single uh, JSON item, depending on the Query. For example, uh, it has this links property. Uh, no, it's not an array, but in some cases, we can have uh, an array returned. Uh, if we look at the headquarters property, it's a type of address, which is a mm. custom type defined in this GraphQL schema. So, so yes, string and int and uh, float as well, and there are some other basic types that are built in the GraphQL uh, specification. And uh, we can also define our own custom types, just like this address type, which, which is defined here. So if I, if I also want to get address back, I can put headquarters here. And now I have to specify which, which fields of the headquarters we need. And the good thing is that this tool has uh, intelligence, so I can just get address and city if I need. 
the file now runs this, I will also get the headquarters back. Oh, it's close to my home. <laughs> <laughs> Rocket Road, are you familiar with that? No, no, Hawthorne is right right next to, to where I live. I, I, I drove by already, like SpaceX. Um, awesome. Yeah. And we are getting yeah. some questions. So some of the viewers are saying, so wait, how does this relate to .NET? Like they're they're trying to draw the lines here. They're like, this is all GraphQL. Like where's .NET? So that's, that's Link. That's coming very soon, I promise. <laughs> yeah, so my idea was basically to, uh, to build a library where you could uh just like with sql we generate the strongly typed classes from the tables and views and their schema and we also have the data context in entity framework where we can uh, which we can use which will uh, generate the sql query for us and also uh, run the query and materialize the resulting um, data in the object. So my idea was that if we can do that for SQL, why can't we do that for GraphQL? So, so here comes .NET. Uh, I can show it now. Uh, I, this, the project that I built, it's, uh, it's kind of a two, two, it has two parts. One is the uh, it's just a .NET tool which you can point to a GraphQL endpoint. It will uh, inspect the schema and generate the uh, classes for every uh, type that it finds, and also uh, generate the class similar to data context that you can use to run GraphQL queries. So I will show that now. Can we zoom in on this as well, Georgie, please? Yes. Awesome. So I'm assuming this query so, context is an object that is from your library. Yes, sort of. So so before before the show, I so let's uh, uh, is it. Uh, can you see this or it's too small on the, the Solution Explorer? Uh, I think that's fine over there on, on the Explorer yeah, side. So one of the projects here is the scaffolding project. It's a tool which uh, you can point to the endpoint. And uh, if you run this, uh, if you run this uh, exe and point it to this, uh, SpaceX endpoint, and it also takes some properties like which folder you want it to output the generated classes and what namespace you want to use. It will inspect this schema, and here is the generated uh, class, for example. Wow, um, that's so cool. There's the, so much stuff there. <laughs> For example, for the companies, this is the info class that was generated from the from, from this type that's defined in the endpoint. So you can see every property that is here is also present in this class. Also the headquarters properties. That was a nested property with, with its own properties, uh, which is address and has uh, these properties. Is also another class, another generated class. So basically, for every uh, type that it found in this endpoint, it generated uh, a separate class, as you would expect in just like the same way Entity Framework does for databases. And the different companies, they publish their schemas so that you can do the, run the scaffolding and yes, generate yes. this. Yes, that's right. The schema is also actually 
exposed on the send point and basically we can just uh, okay. here we can take this query so the the graphql query to to get this schema is also a graphql query itself uh, so so basically, you can query any GraphQL endpoint for its schema with GraphQL syntax. So this is the query that the console app uses that I showed. So if I run this query now, I, I will get the information about every type that's defined right, in this right. endpoint. So that was actually a question. So Eugene is asking, did you generate these classes manually? So the answer is no, kind no, of twofold, of right? <laughs> Uh, no. You did have to run a command, though, right? You you ran this little. Yeah, I, I ran this command. Yeah, I ran this command. It takes the endpoint address, so it actually ran this query on this endpoint, just like I did now, and then it, for every type that was found in this array, generated the corresponding C sharp class. Right. Okay. That's, that's actually really cool. So it is similar to like EF core. I mean, there's some manual stuff there. We do have another question right away. They're asking, you know, how does this interact with like EF core code first? Is that an option if you could do like code first or is that not something that's baked in yet? Um, so this library and tool is for uh, querying the GraphQL endpoints and not building the server-side uh, GraphQL uh, services. So, so it can't really generate the GraphQL service implementation for you. It can, it's only for querying. Like with Entity Framework code first, you can define the types in your code and have it EF generate the database for you. But in this case, for this library, it's it's the client side only, and it does not allow, it's not for building the server side implementation of the services. Right, right, right. We got another follow up question, and this is exactly where my brain went. So the, the same user is asking, is there a .NET 6 source generator for this? So instead of the approach of manually running like a command line to generate a project, um, I was thinking the same thing. It'd be really cool if we had a source generator that instead, yeah. like you attribute something in a project and then it just emits yes. all that code and compiles as part of the yeah. context. Yeah, so there is not. And one of the reasons is that I started building it before the source generators uh, were invented a couple of years ago. So oh, awesome. uh, that .NET tool was the only choice. And, and the second... Uh, thing is that I did not have enough time to build the source generator, so. But it is so open source, it, right? right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the hard work is already done. So uh, basically, you just need to take the code from this scaffolding project and put it in, in the source generator, I guess, and tweak it a little bit, probably to make it work in a source generator context because the code to run this introspection query and to parse the resulting uh, JSON response is already in this project. So it's like 80% there, I think. Like this is the code which runs this uh, right. introspection query and generates the classes. So it just needs to be packaged as a source generator. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's a, I might take a stab at that <laughs> doing a pull request because this is really cool. I, I actually did a, a source generator for some other stuff just recently, and it actually does web APIs and relies on the results of those to generate stuff. So it's a similar concept along you know these lines where maybe you have an attribute that points to the GraphQL endpoint, right? And it does the introspection and it generates the bits and... I love it. Yeah, this is great. sure. Yeah, it would be really cool. So, so yeah. The this is the this class is the uh, 
class that actually does the code generation. It currently uses Rustlin, so so yeah, it would not be too difficult to take this and turn it into a source generator because all the logic is in this class. It just needs to be turned into a source generator. And after you run that tool command, um, what are the folders that you end up with here? Because you, you have some extra ones that you probably added later, like the demo and things like that. Uh, yes, I have here a couple of uh, other folders from other uh, GraphQL endpoints. And demo is just the console app where, which I will now use to show the how to actually use the generated classes. So it's just a console lab for uh, I will now use to run queries with C sharp against this endpoint. So, so the only thing that's generated though, to be clear, is the project called generated. Yes. Okay. Yes, that's the only thing that's generated to is different folders for different endpoints. Okay, so you can run multiple times the command for different endpoints and create different namespaces so you have yes yeah, if you need to query different endpoints you can have them in different uh, folders in same project or when as ever you wish them to have organized and we got a question earlier that i don't know if, i don't i'm not familiar with graphql but does link to GraphQL supports full-fledged complexity, complexity limiting? So are you familiar with that concept? I'm not so like. Uh, okay, sorry, what, what, it supports uh, complexity. Limiting. Uh, so I think if I understood it correctly, it means uh, that some of the GraphQL endpoints limit how how deep your query can be so that uh, you don't run uh, any brute force attacks on the servers. And if that's what's, what the question was, uh, yeah, maybe. The, client, the client library does not support it. Okay. Yeah, and maybe, maybe Anton can, um, can clarify uh, the question as well. Yeah, so apart from the uh, types and uh, that it uh, finds in the endpoint and generates classes for them. It also generates this query context, which is the class through which you can run the GraphQL queries. It's uh, for the base class for for this uh, classes in the library that I wrote, and in this. This specific query context is uh, specific to this to the space tickets endpoint. So you can see that it passes the endpoint address as the base URL for to the base class, and for for every uh, operation that is exposed here on the uh, query objects like users, user segregate, and so on. It has a separate C sharp uh, uh, method. Clever. Uh, so this user's operation has some parameters, and this method also has the parameters uh, that correspond to this. And for the query name, it specifies the uh, query name. So for he, for this one, it's users. So it passes users here. And so on and so on. So, so yes, this class it was also generated, and the base class is in the library, and you don't really need it for running queries. So, so yeah, if we the, if we get back to the queries that I started with for getting the company data. So if we had to write this with uh, no compile time checking and so on, uh, once these classes are generated, we can just write it like this. Uh, we can write spacex.company and this is the 
So this two item is the method that will actually trigger the HTTP call to the endpoint and the company instance that we have here will have the data populated from uh, from this JSON into the object in this instance. So, so SpaceX company just just like Link, it just describes the query that we want to run, and the two item will actually run this specific. It will generate this query and run it against the endpoint and uh, parse the JSON in this object. And you said if that's making an HTTP call, is there uh, an async overload? Yes, yeah, there is not yet, but yeah, it's open source. And if someone wants to uh, contribute, it will be nice. Absolutely. So apart from, so the by default, when you write the query like this, it will uh, uh, run this query and uh, get all the you know, color properties. So it won't query for the headquarters property, which which is like a native property because it has its own properties. So it will only load the properties which are which are not custom types and are basic, basic color types like string and int. We can also do uh, kind of uh, anonymous objects. So we can do com company and select only the properties that we need if we want to, uh, if we don't need other properties and we want to limit ourselves to uh, specific properties only, so I can like write it like this, like name and so it will now be an anonymous object. Don't know, you're not concerned about that GraphQL syntax anymore. You just write C sharp code. Yeah, you. Yes. Uh, yeah. So with this case, in this example it will query for every scalar property in this case it will uh, query for only these two properties I, I can actually run it and so we can go through the examples first and run it later or so here is a, another query with where we uh, just get only these properties and the nested headquarters property, which has its own properties. And in this case, it will now query for all properties that's defined on this type. Uh, we can, well, yeah, go on. I was gonna say, there's a, a couple questions that are stacking up here. I'm just gonna rip through some of them really quick. Anton asked a question that I think we already answered. He's asking about uh, endpoints with schema stitching, generated model classes. Uh, will those also be in separate namespaces? I think the generator, you said you can have multiple namespaces generate into the same um, project, if I understood that yeah, correctly. Yeah, yeah, you can specify you can specify which where you want it to be saved, which folder, which namespace you want to use, so okay. they won't clash with each other. Uh, and Verzak said, is there two item async? And that, that's what I was alluding to also. Uh, not yet, but uh, it sounds as though Georgie would love your pull request. So <laughs> um, uh, another one, uh, in case of model name collisions, uh, that, oh, that's going back to the- He was just spaces. clarifying that the question, ah, yes. yes. Okay. Uh, and then Eugene has one as well. Yes, Eugene. Uh, does it mean that for each new GraphQL query, you need to generate new C# -sharp classes? No, no, you don't need to do that. You generate the classes once for the endpoint, and as long as the schema does not change, you don't need to generate them. Uh, and you just write as many queries as you need. 
Right, right. So I guess taking a step back, the typical workflow is you have a GraphQL endpoint that you want to work against. So then you'll run the generator one time, generate the classes and the corresponding queries that are possible for that endpoint. And then you'll consume it either in, uh, you know, any type of application, whether it's a client application, yes. um, command line, uh, whatever it is. And then from that, you'll have the, um, the, the query context, which is a subclass of your graph context, which is yes. specific yeah. to the stuff that was generated. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So if the schema changes, your queries will fail in runtime if it's a breaking change. So you need to update the generated classes by running the generator again and probably fix your code as well. But uh, unless the schema changes, you only run this tool once. And and to be clear, like I, so for me, one of the initial disconnects was you know, I, I've done a lot from .NET where I would consume GraphQL endpoints. And I was always doing that with giant like templated strings. And that's very tedious because like you said before, if you have a typo or, you know, the, the field name doesn't match or an object no longer has something that was previously nested or any of those type of like, you know, schema changes or uh, imperfections, your code's not going to work. But with what you've done, it's all generated for you. So it's therefore strongly typed. And as such, you can consume it as long as it doesn't change under the covers, right? When you're yes. consuming. Yes. That's right. It. Yeah. If it doesn't change uh, silently on the servers, then you are good to go and you do it once. Awesome. I love it. What uh, sort of following up on that? this topic, um, how, how does that versioning work? And, um, you know, does, is there a way for, I guess, GraphQL link to sort of manage different versions or, uh, yeah, just have different versions of the, of the API? Uh, well, I would, I guess that would depend on how the endpoints, the server side is doing the versioning. Usually with GraphQL, uh, the way to do it is to put the, you can have you can still have the old properties, but you can mark them as obsolete. So someone who will just, just like obsolete works in the world, like you obsolete it and new users, uh, you'll see new endpoint, new properties, but you maintain record compatibility for all their clients. This, the GraphQ, GraphQL link library does not uh, do anything for Backward compatibility. And I'm seeing this render method. So is that something that is part of the schema or is that something that is part of your created project? Uh, which method? The render, like, so I see render. Oh, no, it's, 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 it's just to put the result on the console. OK. So yeah, we can also include the navigation properties if we want to. Uh, so we could write a query like this. We could we can query for the company and put include the headquarters and also the links. And it will generate a query that will have the uh, headquarters with their properties and also the, the links. Uh, ah, right. Properties. OK. I like that. I was actually going to ask about that. So um, if someone's consuming your library and they want to like debug the actual queries that are going over the wire, is there a way to like visualize like the computed query that will actually be sent yes. as part of the request? Yeah. Yeah. So you can assign this uh, query object to before you run it with the two item or two list method and if you do two string, it will actually output the uh, GraphQL query. Uh, I love that. I love that. That's that's perfect. Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, one of the things that developers definitely need to look at the generated queries. So, 
So yeah, so all the queries that we saw up till now, it was only returning one object. So we can also missions, for example, missions is one of the uh, operations exposed here. And it will, this operation returns the missions that SpaceX has launched. It has this limit offset and the find the arguments to limit the missions. Find uh, itself is a user-defined type, which has like this ID and name and manufacturer. So here, here is an example of how we would query for missions which for which the manufacturer was this specific manufacturer. And in, in this case, missions, uh, you can see it, it's in the square brackets. So it means that it returns an array of mission objects. Because of this, the, the way to turn the query into the objects is to call, call the to list. So, so we will get a list of the missions, the generated class. Uh, uh, yes, the generated methods. Uh, it either returns a GraphQL item query or graph collection query, depending on whether the operation itself returns a list or single item. So we can run this query and we can we will get back all the missions that satisfy this specific condition. And we uh, had another question from Anton. Uh, does the model generator support GraphQL directives? Uh, no, it does not uh, support directives at the moment. And just like we saw with previous queries, we could, we can also, for example, if, if we have this query here, we can run this query and then we can uh, compose on top of this query, just like with uh, entity framework where you can append the operators on the query. So we could run this query, we could then to an include that we also want payloads. And then we will get the payloads as well back from this uh, endpoint. And we can also have the, uh, in, inside the include method, we can also have the, uh, we can query for, nested properties, like for every launch, we can get links to rockets and for every rocket, we get, we get the payloads for the second storage and, but query for only the specific property in this case, it's manufacturer. Awesome. So I will, uh, I will now run the demo app to show the uh, results that we get back from running these queries. So this is just for this company query. And here is the uh, company information that was returned from the endpoint. So this is the result of this uh, of this query. Uh, we can also get only these properties, and uh, we will get this here. So headquarters is a nested property, so it's in its own block here. We can also get the so here is the example of this to string over uh, right, which will now output the whole query. So for this query, the generated GraphQL query looks like this. 
uh, it's uh, it also has the variables section. We will see it used in the uh, next demo. If we if if the operation takes uh, takes arguments, they will be passed in as variables here. So if for example, for example, this query takes arguments, so this would end up in the uh, variables section here. So, so this query for missions returns the returns three items, and we will now see those three uh, missions that satisfy this filter condition. And uh, just just for the live viewers here, all of those uh, optional parameters, like on missions, for example, where you have like that new missions find, that's all generated as well, right? That comes from right. the query yes. definitions. Right. Okay. This mission, missions find is also a generated class because it was in the GraphQL schema. Perfect. So it will now also include payloads in the query and uh, output the payloads too. And this is this super complex query with four launches, which returns links, rockets, and all the related. So here is the output of this query. That's so cool. <laughs> different launches. Um, before you end that, are you able to uh, uh, go back to Visual Studio? Are you able to grab that query and just put it in the immediate window and do a two string on it? From uh, like line 75, just grab like space context. Yeah, I, I, I need for this, for the last one, yes. Yep, yep. I want to see what that query looks like. <laughs> And while you're doing that, just as a, as a comment here, I think that a really great way to explore this library and, and query these GraphQL APIs uh, would actually be notebooks, right? Where you have that interactive uh, way of, of you know, writing code and visualizing. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, at least for me, that's, that's sort of something that I need to go try. That's awesome. And you got a nice compliment from Nicholas Jose there saying that he's not a big fan of Strawberry Shake, which I think is another open source GraphQL project because you have to write the queries in GraphQL manner. So your library seems to resolve the issue because it's like you're writing C sharp code and it's like you don't have to think about the complexities there. Absolutely. I just want to echo that because I've written a lot of uh, uh, queries, you know, string templates, and it's a pain in the butt. So this is so much better. <laughs> yeah, it's it's it probably depends on the background of the developer too. If if they are used to writing these queries uh, in other um, languages, like if they use Node.js or some other languages, and they write GraphQL queries will in string literals and they they will find the strawberry approach more familiar this is more targeted to more c -sharp developers who are spoiled with link i guess so you can see the query now for this one So before before I show the output of this one of this query, the the object itself, the query has uh, also it split the query itself is composed of two parts: the query itself and the variables. So variables are the ones that we are passed here, and the two string uh, just depends just combines this query and query variables together. So if we if we check the console now, so this is the query that was generated. Okay, can you see it? 
Mm -hmm. Yep. So, so if I actually copy this and put it here, and I put the, it needs you, you need to pass the parameters for limit and offsets, then you can run it uh, here as well. I can uh, think I can do it. That was zero. If I run this here, I will also get the same data back. Beautiful. I love so, it. So yeah, you would need to write all this big query. <laughs> so much easier. Yourself. And the query variables contains the two arguments that we passed the limits and offsets into this method. And the two string will print the combined, the whole query combined with arguments as well. So it has the variables here. Yep. Awesome. Well, Nicholas did ask a, a follow-up right. question here. He's like, so what's the next steps, right? You've got this library out there. You got this open source project. Some people might be using it. Some might not be like, what, where do we go from here? Oh, we can go to the issues in the GitHub repository and work on And he's saying there's no milestone on GitHub. So it could be great in order to contribute. So like maybe, um, do you want to share the repo um, and see like, so we can look like, look at it and. Yeah, so there are some, uh, some issues, uh, some edge cases where, where it does not uh, generate correct queries. There is also some uh, improvements. So there is also, uh, the ticket might by me to support the sync await and uh, yeah, it, it, so. You have now the, the, the source generator suggestion yeah, as well. Source generator we, as well. <laughs> so, <can> log. <laughs> so we're just so giving yeah. you more work, Georgie. That's all we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> so, but there is no specific milestone, right? Like this is like a, like a, a side project that you're working on. And so um, do you have any yes, priorities yes. in terms of what you would like to do next? Um, well, I would to, um, first want to fix these issues before implementing new features, but uh, there is only limited time. And so, so yeah, if someone wants to contribute, that would be awesome. Awesome. All right. And I don't know if anyone can comment on this uh, question from Jose. Uh, like, when do you recommend using GraphQL or old data? Actually, I will uh, recommend to watch this uh, show on Entity Framework Community Stand Up. I will now try to find it was about or data versus GraphQL. So I think that would answer that question a lot better than me. <laughs> That's a great suggestion. Uh, it was pretty recently, so I don't know if this which one it is, but yeah, I can if find the link and you can probably put it in the comments section. Awesome. Thank you so much, Georgie. Um, and for um, on the next Monday, uh, on June 13th, we're going to have David Mark Carter to talk about code quality and performance. So stay tuned and come back to, to, to hang out with us again. Um, and we really, really appreciate your participation here in Georgia. It was a really, really cool library. I learned a ton, so um, I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was nice for me as well to share uh, 
my work and nice to hear that it was useful and interesting for, for the viewers as well. Awesome. Well, we'll have to have you back and, and, and show all the improvements to the library from the open source community. <laughs> yes, that would be cool. Cool. All right. Well, uh, till next time, folks. Um, we'll be back here next Monday, as Meyer said, um, where we're going to be talking with David McCarter <clears throat> about code quality and performance. Um, Georgie kind of did part of the job here for us, which is uh, if you like the show or shows like it, uh, make sure to check out dot.net slash live where there's tons of other shows on specific topics like entity framework for example um, and you can check out the recordings on there so with that uh thanks again for joining us and uh see you next monday bye folks bye friends bye, bye.